Hi, everybody. This is Mary Beth from Operation Parent. We just wanted to open the doors and let attendees get in. Um, as you're coming in, if you are brand new to Operation Parent, you've never attended one of, our, one of our webinars, we would love for you to go down into the question section of the panel here and click in the box and just type in your first name and where you're attending from. So this is for those of you who've never attended an Operation Parent webinar before. We just want to say hi and uh, oh boy, they're coming in quick. All right, so we have Julie. Uh, hold on. Sorry, they're moving a little bit faster than I can keep up with. We have Julie from Arizona, Abigail from Iowa, Hope, uh, Emily from Texas. Thank you for being here. Erica from New York, Staten Island. Uh, looks like Jeanette from Idaho. Somebody here from Massachusetts, Sarah. Uh, Sabrina from New York, uh, Matt from Catawissa, Pennsylvania, and I know how to say Catawissa because I went to school in Bloomsburg. Um, let's see, Nancy from Pennsylvania, Matt from Rapids, uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. We got a lot of people in here from Texas, Kayla from Indiana. Okay, oh boy, okay. I'm sorry, I'm just kind of getting all these different little things that are popping up. Okay. Uh, wow, Monsignor Carr from Buffalo. Thank you for attending here. I'm, I'm welcome. Amy from Ohio. Uh, Nina from Philly. Uh, we got somebody in here from Connecticut. Colleen from New York. Uh, Megan from Iowa. So Brittany from Philly, from Pennsylvania, I saw a couple jerseys, Chanel from Hawaii. We had a big contingent from Hawaii register for this event. So thank you for um, taking the time out here. Okay, um, it is a minute before two o'clock. So as soon as it hits two, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Again, these were people who have never attended before. We just wanted to give a shout out and get the chance to see where you're from. Uh, I see a, a Mandy from um, Washington. A Michelle from New York, from New Jersey, uh, April from Oregon. So, all right, thank you so much for doing this. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and get moving into our webinar. So again, my name is Mary Beth Huberti from Operation Parent, and I wanna welcome you to Marijuana Parenting for Prevention in 2020. Our speaker today is Christine Storm, and we are really excited to have her here. She's from Karen Treatment Center. Um, and she is from the Philadelphia area, or is in the Philadelphia area, I should say. So for our next webinar, uh, we are scheduled for in May, May 18th, to have uh, Clifford Schussman. Uh, he's a child and adolescent psychiatrist, and he's going to be discussing survival guide to teen screen time and gaming excess during um, the COVID-19 situation. He is an expert. He's been um, featured on articles and on TV discussing this topic. So we're really excited to have him here um, on May 18th. Registration is already open for that event. So I just encourage you to go ahead and get in there and register for that event. Um, and with that, I'm going to open up the uh, telephone, my uh, microphone for Michelle to come on in. Michelle, are you there? I'm here, yes. All right, and Michelle's gonna do some technical and I will catch up with you later. Thank you. Awesome. Go ahead, Michelle. Just wanted to remind you guys that Operation Parents Mission is to love and support parents by providing real world information, connection, and hope. On your webinar control panel, you'll see an orange arrow at the very top. Just click on that orange arrow to minimize the control panel um, if it's in your way and you don't want to see it. But for right now, just click on the orange arrow and let's view all the features together. Many of you just utilized um, the question feature, which we'll utilize throughout the presentation today. Just letting you know, you will be muted during this presentation. We would, however, like to hear from you via this question section. So if you haven't had a chance to check it out yet, it's about halfway down the control panel and um, it's labeled just with the word question at the top. You're gonna send both questions and comments here. You can send us questions anytime during this 
live webinar. You don't have to wait till the end. And we really love questions, and we know you um, love to spend time with a professional answering those questions. We will definitely go over the 60 minute mark with the presentation that we've prepared for you today. So just know um, that you will receive a recording of this presentation tomorrow if you're not able to hang with us um, throughout the entire presentation, but hopefully you can. We've put together an awesome lineup of handouts for you today. The first one is a copy of the slides that you will view with us today. And then the next one is titled Marijuana Talk Kit, and this is from the partnership from Drug Free Kids. We also have um, a parent fact brochure and the digital program sub substance abuse, and this is from the Caron Treatment Center. It's resources and education for parents, as well as the one titled Now is a Good Time to Talk to Your Kids. Right below that question feature, you'll see the handout section. Just double click on those handouts should you like to download them. The handouts will only be available in this location while we are in session. Once the webinar has ended and the session is closed, you will not be able to download from this location. Prior to this webinar, you should have received an email containing the handouts. So if you don't decide to download them there, look for them in your email. Just know that we are recording this presentation today and the, the recording will be sent to you tomorrow afternoon. In addition, I wanted to share with you, should we um, encounter any technical difficulties today, Christine Storm, our presenter, um, also agreed to do an uh, advanced recording with us. So should we hit any technical difficulties at all, we do have a clean recording that will be sent to you following this presentation. There will be a short survey sent to you directly after the webinar. It's only going to take you about two minutes to complete, and I promise you we always utilize this feedback. You, our viewers, are remarkable about doing this survey, and I can assure you that we use the feedback immediately. Now it is my distinct pleasure to turn this webinar over to Christine Storm. She is exceptionally prepared a awesome uh, presentation on marijuana, and we're looking forward to getting going here. Okay, thank you so much, Mary Beth and Michelle, and all the parents and professionals joining us today. I'm uh, thrilled with the turnout. I was told there were over 1,500 parents that registered, so that's amazing. No pressure being felt over here at all. Um, and I think as I'm trying to find silver linings in all of the stresses of today, this is really one of those that with life being a little bit more slow right now, parents have more time to connect with their teens and more time to take advantage of educational opportunities like this one to help them with their parenting. So I'm Christine Storm. Um, that's a, a picture of me from a few years ago. Uh, and my hair is in desperate need of a color and a cut as many of you can probably relate to. Um, but other than that, all is well. And I'm joining you today from my home office in Wilmington, Delaware. I'm the Director of Community Education for Karen Treatment Centers, and if you've never heard of Karen before, we are a not-for-profit addiction treatment and behavioral health care provider, and we're in our 63rd year of operation, which is really unique in this industry to have that kind of longevity. At our main campus is in a town called Wernersville, Pennsylvania, and there we treat teens through older adults with substance use disorder. And then we also have additional treatment centers for adults in Florida, in Boca Raton and Delray Beach. And I've worked um, since 2004 uh, for Karen's education department. So I'm not on the treatment side of things. My job and the focus of our department is largely on the prevention of substance use disorder and working on early intervention. So getting help for kids who have started using. Our department works with kindergarten through college age, as well as the parents and professionals in those young people's lives that can help support drug prevention. So I know that with today's topic, there is no more controversial or misunderstood drug than marijuana in our society, which is partly why it is so difficult to parent against. For every um, fact that we have, um, you know, there are other facts out there that negate that. And it's really challenging to understand where to go with that. And um, I have an 18-year-old son myself, 
And I get the struggle with trying to be the voice of reason when their friends and the media are telling them it's just weed, relax. Um, so let's take a look at some of the objectives for today's training. So uh, one of the things that I want to make sure that you all understand is your role and how important it is. So I want parents to, to really understand the vital role that they play in preventing teen marijuana use and to help you figure out how you can have more effective conversations with your tween or your teen and how to set some expectations that will help to prevent against them using. And um, an important part of this is taking a look at what the trends are. So today's presentation is very visual. I'm hopeful that you will walk away understanding the landscape of today. Um, you won't be as well researched as a lot of the people that use marijuana themselves are, uh, but you should have some basic understanding of what some of the trends are that your child might be exposed to. Um, want parents to gain knowledge of the potential impact of marijuana on things like memory, motivation, mental and physical health, and then driving skills. And then to take a look at what you can do as a parent if you're noticing some signs that are concerning. Um, one of the things that we're seeing right now at Karen is that now that parents are with their teens more, we are getting more calls into our admissions office with just, I'm noticing things that I didn't notice before because I'm with my child all the time. Um, so we'll talk about what you can do if you have some of these concerns and um, what actions you can take. Okay, so I love starting presentations for parents and other adults with doing a little walk down memory lane to kind of compare our own experience as teens with what teens are going through today. So remember the good old days, right? And let's take a look at some things that those of you who grew up in different decades than now uh, might recognize. So we talked on telephones, right? So um, I was a child of the 80s and 90s, and before we had cordless phones, this is what our phones looked like. And in our house, there were two corded phones. There was one in the kitchen and one in my parents' bedroom. And so if I wanted to have conversations with my friends about what we were gonna do on a Friday, Saturday night, it was a lot more visible than a lot of our kids' conversations are today. Um, we spread information either by writing letters or, you know, face-to-face -face communication. We spent a lot more time with our friends in person. So if you were a teen in the 80s, this, this fashion might look familiar to you. Um, we also spent a lot more time outside. Um, a lot of adults will reminisce that there was a rule in their house that, you know, you were outside all day and then you came home when the street light was on. That meant it was dinner time and you were in for the night. And then our, our nicotine was smoked and our marijuana was weak, okay? So our smoking rates were really high. Uh, the marijuana that was being smoked is very different than it is today. And frankly, we did not have much in the way of technology, right? Um, the latest and greatest in technology might have been a Walkman or a giant first-generation computer. All right, now let's take a look at how this differs from today. So today, our teens and us as adults, we're communicating through devices. So most of our waking hours, most of our kids' waking hours, they are attached to some kind of electronic device. It's how they communicate. It's how they learn about the world. It's how they get information. And we're seeing more and more, it's how kids are obtaining drugs. It's how they're learning about them and things like that. Um, we can send information in, the, in a split second. Um, so some of the the mistakes that your child might make now are a lot more visible than they ever used to be. Social media dominates. Um, so it's a big part of instead of socializing in person, how our teens are keeping in touch with one another. They're following their favorite people on YouTube. Um, they can learn all sorts of unsavory things on things like YouTube. They can follow their favorite um, influencers and things like that. They're spending a lot more time indoors. And I really encourage you guys to take Dr. Sussman's next presentation with Operation Parent. He's fantastic. And um, he helped Karen to develop our digital addiction program that we have for 18 and over down in Florida. But more and more, I'm talking to parents who are con extremely concerned, especially with their, their you know, 12 year old, 13 year old sons and the amount of time that they're spending on games and addictions to that. And then, of course, the drugs of today are different. 
It's the same three drugs of choice that are the highest. The highest drugs of choice when you guys were teenagers were was alcohol, nicotine, and marijuana. It's still the same three today, but we know that these can be consumed in different ways than they could before, with vaping being um, the most different. And as we see, every single one of these is related to technology. So technology has really changed things. And I bring this up because it's very tempting for us to want to compare our own teenage experiences with the ones our kids are going through. And I hear from parents all the time, well, it's just marijuana. I smoked pot in high school. It was just a phase. I'd rather them be doing that than some of the other drugs that are out there. And I get that. Um, but I think it's important for us to be aware that not only is the world of teens today different because of all the advances in technology, that the drugs are also different and marijuana more than any other drug. And so that mentality that it's only pot really needs to change, um, especially as we're talking about teen use. So hopefully, even if you are on this line today, all for legalization and you think that that's the way to go, that's fine. That's not what this presentation is going to be about, no debate. Um, but I do hope that we can all agree that recreational use by teens with developing brains is a really risky idea and something that we want to protect against. And that's really what this presentation is going to focus on. To get this started, I'm going to, we're, so we're, we're not going to do polls today, um, but I do think like just at your own seat here, you can try to come up with the answer to this question. Um, these this question and the next one uh, were developed using data from the 2019 Monitoring the Future report. And Monitoring the Future is a national survey that's done on a large sample of 8th, 10th, and 12th graders from across the country every year. And they've been doing this, this anonymous survey since 1975. So it's really been our way of tracking trends over the years and um, helping us in this industry figure out what do we really need to be setting goals and tackling. So what do you guys think about this? What percentage of 12th graders have ever used marijuana? Well, the answer is that by the spring of senior year, 43.7% of teens have ever tried marijuana. Um, and while this is high, it still means that the majority, 56.3%, have never tried marijuana before. This next question is asking about eighth graders. Um, so more eighth graders were using marijuana in 1999 than in 2019. That answer is true. So while we haven't made much headway with reducing use in the past decade, we are down pretty significantly from where we were 20 years ago. And that really helps us to understand that prevention works. Prevention education um, has gone through a lot of different phases and tactics throughout the years. We've tried scaring kids out of using and overloading them with facts and then teaching them it's as simple as just saying no. Um, but the current approach that we're using today that's really helped us to achieve some of the lowest substance use rates ever is a much more positive approach. It involves teaching not just facts, uh, but also empowering kids with things that we know that they need to have fun and to cope with life without using drugs. So we focus a lot on um, you know, emotional intelligence and strong coping skills and setting goals for the future, uh, developing a sense of purpose, setting boundaries for yourself and your friendships and relationships so that you can make the right choices for you. And we need to keep up this approach in schools. And then parents, your influence is even more critical than what your child's health teacher might be telling them. And hopefully through this webinar, you're going to feel empowered to take on that role as the primary influencer over your, your teen's choices to use substances. But then we're also going to talk about the fact that even if you do everything right as a parent, some kids are still going to use, right? Um, and from this slide, we can see that in, in eighth grade, in middle school, some kids are already experiencing or experimenting with substances. And these are kids we need to be really concerned about. Um, they would be the most at risk for substance use disorder because of their young age and brain development. We're going to talk uh, throughout this webinar about the incredible rise in THC levels that we're seeing with various cannabis products. So let's make sure we understand what THC is. It is the main psychoactive or mind-altering chemical in marijuana, and it's responsible for most of the intoxicating effects that people seek. Um, the marijuana plant, the cannabis plant, also contains more than 500 other chemicals in addition to THC, 
and more than 100 of those compounds are chemically related to THC. And we call them cannabinoids. You have cannabinoid receptors in many areas of the brain. And as we can see from this picture, when THC is smoked, vaped, or eaten, and it makes its way to the brain, there's a number of short-term effects that are going to happen. Altered senses. So for instance, somebody might see brighter colors. An altered sense of time, changes in mood, impaired body movement and motor control, difficulty with thinking and problem solving, increased hunger, elevated heart rate, impaired memory. And um, one of the more scary things that, that can happen is that with really high doses of THC, there's the potential for hallucinations, delusions, and even psychosis. And psychosis is, is a detachment from reality. Um, another interesting thing about marijuana is that most drugs are water soluble and they leave your body pretty quickly, but not THC. THC is fat soluble, which means that it accumulates in the fat cells of the body and it leaves your body very slowly. So generally, one time use, it might stay in your system after the high has worn off for a few days. But if somebody regularly uses, they use maybe every, you know, a couple times a week or even every day, it can build up in their body and take months to metabolize and leave. And some residual effects on memory and mood may continue during that time period. So as the cannabis industry has become competitive, growers are really looking to make a name for themselves. And one of the ways they've done this is by trying to produce plants that will lead to a more intense high. So by growing seeds in certain conditions with certain lighting, they've succeeded in really completely changing cannabis. In the 70s, the, the marijuana plant had an average THC content of about 1.5%, pretty low amount. In the 90s, it had jumped to about 4%. And now we know that the average THC content of what somebody might be smoking is around 17%, with the ability to get strains well above 30%. So this change is why we're seeing an increase in people having very adverse reactions to marijuana and also developing cannabis use disorders that require treatment. Nobody went to rehab for marijuana in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and now it's the number one drug of choice for teens entering treatment. So another thing that's changed is that stereotype of kind of the happy, chill stoner. Like that is not what we are seeing in our patients parents raising teens with a cannabis use disorder are much more likely to be seeing anger reactions in their teen when they try to take their marijuana away from them, punching holes in walls, displaying really troubling behavior that leaves them at a loss for what to do. Um, I know an interventionist who, who said that his least favorite interventions are with young people who are abusing marijuana. Um, because, you know, you could go into an intervention with somebody addicted to heroin, and they're never going to argue that what they're doing is okay, right? Um, but we see that with marijuana, that no matter how many issues it's causing in someone's life, they will be very defensive and argue and have staunch research to back them up. Um, you know, they'll go into terpenes and and indica versus sativa blends and like little scientists and, and you know, it's overwhelming and, and that's part of what you're up against. So very defensive. Um, all right, so let's, let's take a look at some of the different ways that cannabis is consumed. And the first is through smoking it. There's many options for smoking the actual cannabis bud or flowers. Could be through a joint, a bowl, a, a blunt, a bong, a bubbler, or various homemade creations. I mean, you can even smoke weed out of an apple, right? The possibilities are endless. Users love to experiment with all the different methods. And um, one of the things I didn't realize before I started doing this work is that glassware, like these bongs and bowls and things, are things that can technically be used to smoke tobacco out of. So they're kind of regulated like tobacco. Um, so before they turned the age to 21 to buy tobacco products, an 18-year-old could go into a smoke shop and buy a bong, right? So um, that's now just changed to 21. It's also incredibly easy online to order these things through the internet. And they could have that delivered straight to your house, or if they're afraid of you intercepting it, they could have it sent to um, a UPS drop location. So I know in my area, my local grocery store has a, is a drop location. So teens will sometimes just have their things they don't want their parents getting delivered to the Acme 
and then they go and pick it up and nobody would know. Um, one thing to be aware of is that inhaling smoke of any kind, whether it's tobacco, weed, or another substance, it's bad for lung health, right? It's an irritant. When people smoke marijuana, they tend to cough a lot. And then we'll, we'll say that it's not bad for your lungs, but any, anything a person smoking is an irritant. In addition to smoking, the dry herbs and flowers can also be used in various vaporized devices, so vaporizers. Um, these devices heat the cannabis instead of burning it. And um, many think it's healthier because it's heated rather than burned. But as most things related to marijuana, there's very little research. So it's hard to kind of back out up whether that's true or not. Um, these vaping devices, like other types of vaping device devices, are battery operated and rechargeable. So this next slide that we're looking at here, um, it's about vaping concentrates of marijuana. So vaping concentrates is not new, but it's certainly less well known by the general public if you're not into researching marijuana. There's a process you can do to the cannabis plant using heat and solvents like butane, CO2, propane, or ethanol to extract potent concentrates of THC. What you're left with after this sort of like cooking process um, are these different forms that are on the slide here. These concentrates can look like wax, they can look more like brittle pieces called shatter, or some of these others. Uh, with these concentrates, we're talking about THC potency between 60 and 90% on average. So anybody using these is seriously drugging their brain. A person would then take these concentrates and put them into vaping devices, referred to as dab or wax pens. Um, and they really do look like pens. Um, and then when they vape, um, it heats it to about 350 degrees and they inhale. This would not have as strong an odor as um, the traditional dry herb does, but it still has a smell to it that's kind of hard to define um, over, you know, without seeing it in person. Um, there is also um, these things called, these glass devices called rigs and they can be used um, to vape the dabs out of as well. Another popular and incredibly easy method of consuming marijuana involves vaporizing pre-filled cartridges of THC oil. So oils are another form of concentrate with potency ranging anywhere from 15 to over 90%. I was working with a student recently who um, pretty much all day long in his bedroom is vaping 91% THC oil. Just, you know, hitting the pen all throughout the day, maintaining a pretty consistent level of a buzz. Um, so these, uh, on, we're seeing on the screen here, um, picture, there's different rechargeable battery devices and there's also some disposable ones. Um, due to the difficulty of, of people actually obtaining true THC oils because of the strict regulations in the industry, some of the people manufacturing THC oils have been using thickening agents like vitamin E acetate to stretch their supply. And this is the main culprit behind um, the 2,807 hospitalizations and 68 deaths to date from the lung injury termed EVALI by the CDC. If you guys remember before the news was overtaken by um, coronavirus information, this Evali was all over the news, trying to figure out why are people coming to the hospital, um, you know, unable to, to breathe and having these significant lung injuries. And what they found through all of their research is that these oils were really the main culprit behind this. Um, so if you want more information about what's going on with that, the CDC and the FDA have great information. But ever since they kind of figured out what the cause was, we're hearing less and less about this. So if we look at the next slide, you can see just a couple of examples of what some of these products were that were being manufactured on the black market and having dangerous additives like vitamin E acetate in them. Um, so this first one here, 56% of people with these lung injuries said that they had based a product called Dank. And Dank's not even one brand, it's packaging. So it's packaging made in China that can be filled with anything. And then some of the other brands were TKO, Smart Cart, and Rove. Okay. 
And marijuana can also be baked into many goods. And as legalization has spread, the options for edibles have greatly expanded. You can get drinks, candies, cookies, just about anything with THC in it. When someone smokes marijuana, they feel the effects pretty quickly, and then they can taper and stop when they have the desired effect. However, with edibles, the feeling is far more delayed. It can take up to two to three hours for the, the edibles to take effect. Somebody might expect that when they eat a marijuana product like a brownie, that they're supposed to feel the feelings immediately. And when that doesn't happen, they might overcorrect by eating more than their body can handle. And when the high dose sets in, it can be an extremely uncomfortable situation. They might feel like they're on the verge of a heart attack. Um, there could also be symptoms of a panic attack, like shallow, rapid breathing. Um, so we find that people are more likely to end up in the emergency room because of adverse reactions to edibles. I wanted to make sure to cover a little bit about CBD today because many people are very curious about it. It's everywhere and it's being advertised as a treatment for literally everything from anxiety to insomnia, inflammation, joint pain, acne, the list goes on and on. They even sell CBD products for your pets, right? You can get CBD infused lattes and facials. It's, it's kind of the wellness product of the moment. Um, it's, it's short for, CBD is short for cannabidiol and it's another chemical in the cannabis plant along with THC. But THC is psychoactive and CBD is not, so it will not get you high. Um, so, so far, uh, there's been some scientific research taking a look at CBD, and they have found and that it's very beneficial in treating two types of seizure disorders in children when it's in medication form. So, Epidiolex is um, an approved medication by the FDA that's meant for these children. Scientists are studying whether CBD might be effective in treating other conditions like anxiety and sleep and pain. Um, but for now, it's really too early to say. There's, there's, it looks promising, but it's a little too early. Um, and I want to caution that CBD products like lotions, bath oils, honey, they've not been proven as effective treatments for anything. Um, so I just want to caution that while there's some good information out there about this, it is also a complete free-for-all at the moment. Nobody is regulating the CBD industry, and you need to be careful about purchasing these products without doing research. Some of them have been found to contain pesticides and other impurities. Some have so little CBD in them that they're not going to do anything and you're wasting your money. So, you know, do your research, talk to your doctor. Um, especially if you or your child that you want to experiment with CBD with, if they're on medication, you know, if they're on antidepressants or if they're on Adderall, we want to make sure that you talk to a doctor to, to make sure that messing around with CBD is not going to interfere with that medication. So let's talk about some of the reasons for teen use of marijuana and some of the risks that it poses. And um, the reason that we spend so much time preaching about the delaying of marijuana and other drug use to teens is really because of the science behind brain development and the risk for addiction and long-term brain changes. We know that the brain develops from back to front. And the last part, that frontal lobe responsible for executive functioning and decision-making and long-term planning, that's not fully developed till a person around age 24. So this means that the adolescent brain is very plastic or malleable or changeable, whatever word you want to use. This plasticity leads to tremendous opportunity, but it's also a period of vulnerability. So the opportunity is that um, this changeable brain makes a teen so much more capable of learning quickly. So a teenager or you know, your middle school students, they can learn a new language, a new instrument, technology, complicated math problems, coping skills, et cetera, so much quicker than we can in adulthood. You know, that whole, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Um, but it's also a time of vulnerability because just like they can learn a new language faster, they can develop unhealthy habits and even addiction more quickly. So addiction's a learning process that happens in the reward center of the brain. So just because, you know, if they can learn one thing more quickly, they can learn addiction more quickly too. So if you start use at a young age, it can lead to faster, longer, and stronger dependence on substances. Let's talk about the mentality of teens a little bit more. As you go back, sorry. <laughs> um, 
Thank you. Uh, as you know, parenting during adolescence is really tough. Your kid wants more freedom without always knowing how to handle it. And they think that they know more than you, even though they don't have the life experience that you have. Um, and we know that during this time, teens are wired to stretch themselves through risk taking and seeking out new experiences. That's normal, it's healthy. It helps them learn about themselves, their interests, their talents and also helps them gain independence so that someday they will leave the nest and begin their own lives. So risk taking can be positive, like maybe trying out for play, um, or it could be harmful, like experimenting with drugs. And the emotional center called the limbic system is extremely active in the teen years, but that decision-making center hasn't caught up yet, meaning that they're more likely to make decisions based on emotion rather than logic. Um, we also know that adolescents experience rewards much more powerfully than adults do. And regardless of knowing that a behavior might be risky, they might choose the potential over the reward rather than fearing the risk. And a lot of these rewards are social. Um, during the teen years, you begin to spend more time with friends and less time with parents. Again, normal and natural. Um, but teens are also highly influenced by their peers during these years. And they sometimes have a really tough time weighing right and wrong in the moment when they're with their peers. And substance use is a highly social thing, especially in the beginning. Friendships can develop around getting high together, and that bond can end up being really powerful. During adolescence, teens are developing an identity, and being, an ide being a stoner can actually be an identity that some will gravitate towards. I've worked with kids who find tremendous self-esteem and importance in being that kid that others go to because they know the most about marijuana. They know where to get the best stuff. They have the best paraphernalia. Um, so with all of this being said, even though they may feel like they're pushing you away during these years and rolling their eyes at everything you have to say, they really need your direction now more than ever, okay? Um, all right, we can move on to the next one. Um, there are so many different reasons why a young person might gravitate towards drug use. We know that drugs can be tools with many functions, and unfortunately, they work really well and really quickly until for some, they start causing more problems than they solve. Um, often a person tries a drug or alcohol for the first time out of either curiosity or they're feeling pressured in some way to fit in. They learn how drugs change them or their interpretation of the world around them. So a really shy girl who has her first drink might realize that alcohol makes her feel more confident and outgoing. A teen with ADHD might find that they feel really calm and relaxed when they smoke marijuana. A girl who's concerned about her weight might learn that vaping nicotine helps suppress her appetite. And then there could be some other teens that try a drug and learn that they hate the way it makes them feel. I've worked with teens who tried marijuana and it made them paranoid and anxious and they hated it. So everybody is different, but obviously the more pleasurable or comforting the experiences are, the more likely a person is to continue their use and to also give up other tools for life in favor of a drug because that drug provides more immediate gratification for discomfort. So what are the dangers of marijuana abuse? Um, the very first one that I wanna talk about is addiction. Um, they were, they're absolutely you know, myths out there that you can't get addicted to weed. And it simply is not true. Um, addiction just is, is kind of a definition of what I'm talking about, sometimes called substance use disorder. It's compulsive drug seeking and the continued use of a substance despite harmful consequences. So we know that that can happen with marijuana. And research suggests that about 9% of people who use marijuana will develop a dependence upon it. And that rate nearly doubles to 17% when marijuana use begins during the teenage years. As I said before, it is the number one, um, you know, marijuana accounts for the largest percentage of admissions amongst teens seeking treatment for substance use disorder. And that dependence, it's not just psychological. Like the psychological part is huge. Somebody feeling like, Weed is their friend. They, they need it to wake up. They need it to go to bed. They need it to be creative. They need it. They need it. They need it. But it can also be a physical dependence as well. If somebody smokes marijuana or vapes it um, and uses it daily for an extended period of time and then they try to stop, they'll experience intense cravings, insomnia, headaches, and significant stomach issues when they stop. Um, it's nothing like the seriousness of withdrawal from alcohol or opiates or benzos of course, but it is uncomfortable enough to deter some people from stopping use on their own. 
Um, there's this bizarre condition that is pretty rare, but it can absolutely happen, and it's called cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. And it's something that can happen to people who regularly abuse marijuana for a long period of time. And it's this um, out of control vomiting. And um, there are, are people who have this happen to them. They're throwing up in large amounts all day long and will still try to argue that their marijuana use is okay. So that is addiction. Um, we know that it can impact learning. Negative effects can happen on attention, motivation, memory, and this learning issues can happen even after the drug has worn off. Um, one of the things that we see in our young adults who started abusing marijuana pretty heavily as teens is that they are having like this failure to launch. Um, so where their peers are starting careers, they're starting relationships, these, these kids are stuck, right? They lost the motivation. They didn't keep progressing and moving forward. Driving is another one, right? There's no more terrifying time as a parent than when your teenager gets their license. We know that sometimes they're overconfident and underskilled. And then if somebody adds marijuana into the mix, they're going to have further issues with judgment, alertness, concentration, coordination, reaction time, ability to judge differences and react to signals and sounds on the road. So that's, that's just can further make it more challenging. And then lastly, let's talk about mental illness. Um, marijuana can become a very powerful coping tool for mental illness. And it's really confusing for young people and even adults to understand how marijuana could be detrimental to mental health, especially when in some states you can get medical marijuana for anxiety and other mental health conditions. So it's confusing. Um, the impact is not fully understood. We do know that high doses of THC, though, they can bring on acute psychosis. They can bring on panic attacks. There is research that shows that early marijuana use can increase the risk of psychotic disorders like schizophrenia if you are already at a higher genetic risk for that. So I really encourage you as parents that if your child is struggling with their mental health, if they are displaying signs of depression, anxiety, or other forms of mental illness, please get them professional help, um, have, you know, talk therapy, have them see somebody that can help them with some really healthy coping skills for this. Because if they find marijuana, they might believe that this is now the solution to their problem. When we know at the end of the day, it often makes it worse. One of the reasons it's so challenging to combat this and lower the amount of teens experimenting with marijuana is that there really is this low perception of harm right now. So as legalization, decriminalization, and medical marijuana, and basically the overall normalizing of cannabis use has come to the forefront, kids' perception of harm is at an all-time low. And like we said before, the drug dangers are at an all-time high. So that's another reason why it's kind of scary. Uh, when perception of harm is low, use goes up. It's not surprising. And it's really hard to escape mentions of marijuana, especially in legalized states where there are pot shops everywhere. Um, if you live in a state where it's legalized, um, it is still considered a essential business. So if, if other businesses are shut down in your area, it's likely that these dispensaries are still open. Um, so there's, there's shops everywhere, there's billboards, advertising, parades and celebration, um, increase in mentions of marijuana in popular music and movies and TV and all over social media with, you know, hashtag cannabis or hashtag 420. Um, 420 was last week, April 20th, kind of considered um, a big marijuana pot smokers holiday. Um, so we, we look out on that date for, for kids um, using. Okay, so let's move this into parents, what can you do? So I think um, when it comes to the kids that you're raising, you could have four children and all of them have different risk and protective factors. They might all have the same environment, but internally they could have some things about them that would make you worry more about one child versus another. So let's take a look at some of these. And the first thing that we're gonna look at is some of the risk factors. So these would be things that um, could put a child at higher risk for experimenting with substances. 
So one is a personality trait being uh, called a sensation seeker. So sensation seekers are kids who tend to be a little bit more impulsive. They like act first and think about it later. Um, this might have been your child that, you know, climbed a lot of stuff when they were little and, and broke bones and scared the pants off of you as a parent. It's not a bad personality trait at all. These are fun people. They are risk takers. Um, but at the same time, we often have to figure out as parents how to channel that energy um, into ways that they can take those risks safely. Another huge um, risk factor is when kids think that the adults in their life either approve of them using substances, expect that they're going to, or will turn a blind eye to it. So, um, and all research and data backs this up. When kids say adults in my life don't care if I use, they use at higher levels, okay? Um, if they're hanging out with a peer group that uses substances. If the dynamics at home are strained, um, if, if there's chaos, if there's fighting, if the kids don't feel like they can come to their parents to talk to them about issues in life, those could be risk factors. Unhealthy role models. So if there are people that your child looks up to that abuse um, marijuana or other drugs, uh, whether that's within your own home, within your family, or within, you know, their, their heroes that they look up to and people that they follow on social media. Um, if they have a poor connection to school, they don't like it, they don't want to go, um, they don't do well, that could all be risk factors. If they don't think it's a big deal and if it's pretty easy for them to access it, which most kids say that it's pretty easy to access marijuana if they wanted to. Um, if it's readily available in their, their home or whatever, then that would be a, a higher risk factor. And the opposite of all of these would be protective. So take, let's take a look at those. If you're raising a child that's a little bit more on the cautious side, they ask a lot of questions first before they just dive in and do something. That's protective. Um, when kids know that their parents disapprove, they don't want them to do it, that they have high expectations for them, that's very protective as well. Um, if they're hanging with kids that don't use substances, that they have other ways of having fun um, and blowing off steam. If the family dynamics are pretty strong and family can look like anything, but the bottom line is when people are connected to one another, um, when parents are using a balanced approach to their parenting, where they have strong rules and expectations, but also have open dialogues with their kids. That's really protective. Um, healthy role models. And I encourage all of us on the line today who are dealing with unprecedented times to take a look at what we're modeling to our kids. I'm aware that um, percentage of alcohol sales has absolutely skyrocketed during COVID-19. Um, and it's really kind of brought up this conversation about what are we modeling to our kids? Are we showing them that this is how you get through tough times by kind of numbing the situation? So nobody's saying you can't drink. It's just take a look at what you're modeling for their child. Your child now is a really amazing time to, um, you know, model and demonstrate resiliency skills. Feeling connected to school, understanding what's harmful, and when parents and communities do everything they can to reduce access, that's all protective. For teens who do use substances, some are at a higher rate for developing a substance use disorder than others would be. So let's take a look at some of those. And we've already discussed some of these a little bit. Starting use at a young age. Um, the younger a person is when they start using, the higher their chance of developing addiction. The stat is somebody that begins abusing substances before age 15 has quadrupled their chances of addiction. So every year you can delay your child's onset of alcohol, nicotine, marijuana, or other drug use, the better off they're going to be. Another is a genetic predisposition. So they say between 40 to 60% of a person's risk for addiction is genetic. So I ask you, does addiction run in your family? And if it does, you should be honest with your child about that. So just like you would let your daughter know if breast cancer runs in the family, you should be letting your children know if addiction runs in the family. It's nothing to be ashamed of. It's about the way your brain might be wired as, as a family. Um, and some teens think that um, addiction is drug specific. And what I mean by that is maybe they have a father 
who is in recovery from alcoholism. And they might think that their marijuana abuse has nothing to do with their father's alcoholism. When in reality, a drug is a drug. So if addiction of any kind runs in the family, any drug your child might pick up, they might have a higher likelihood of developing dependence on it. Some of these others are environmental. So um, a child that's, that's being raised in an environment where there's, there's drug abuse, if they've had exposure to physical, sexual, or emotional trauma, um, and if they are surrounded by it. And then the, the other are psychological factors. So um, some of those personality traits we talked about before, impulsivity, high sensation seeking, but then also um, psychiatric and personality disorders. So depression, anxiety, eating disorders, and things like that do raise the potential for addiction because um, some people will use those to self-medicate. And the longer they self-medicate, the more they give up other tools in life and this becomes how they handle everything. So let's take a look at some possible warning signs of marijuana use. And these warning signs are physical, they're behavioral and attitude-based, and then they could have um, be related to productivity. So the physical changes, some of the things that you might look out for uh, could be bloodshot eyes. So we know that marijuana interferes with the ocular pressure in your eyes. Um, so if your child has, you know, red eyes or you're seeing visine in their room, um, marijuana can make a person very hungry. So if we're seeing this ravenous appetite, um, slowed reaction time, you seem really thirsty all the time, sleepy, their coordination is off and you're just smelling things that, or cause for concern, those would all be things. Uh, behavior and attitude changes. A lot of times when people start getting involved with drug use like marijuana, adults suddenly become the enemy. Um, so you might see a change in your child, withdrawing from family, not wanting to be a part of any family outings or traditions, um, being secretive, lying, um, locking their bedroom door a lot more. Maybe they've had an abrupt change in friends and they, they are asking for money constantly and really defensive and, and sometimes like nervous and paranoid. And then productivity changes. One of the sad things is that we will often see kids give up activities that they were once passionate about in order to make room for marijuana use. So maybe they, they stop um, running track or they give up music or something like that. Um, less motivation, they're being, being way more forgetful than they ever used to be, and maybe not doing as well in school. So these would all be things to look out for. And now some of the paraphernalia, okay? So here's just a, a mix of different things that could indicate uh, marijuana abuse. So these little baggies that marijuana is often sold in. Um, scales, scales for weighing out um, quantities of marijuana. When a person buys those wax or dab concentrates, they often come in these little silicone or plastic or sometimes glass containers. Um, mason jars for storing and, and uh, covering up the odor of marijuana. Lighters and torches um, to be refilled with butane are often used when somebody is using one of those dab rigs to, to keep the, the, the wax um, you know, heated at a high temperature. Grinders, when a person buys um, you know, flower buds of marijuana, they need to grind that up to be able to put that into a blunt or to a joint. So you might find a grinder, which is usually like a small colorful tin. Um, glassware cleaner. So if there's isopropyl alcohol and Epsom salts in your child's bedroom, and you know that in general they're a slob, it might you know, indicate that they're trying to clean something. And that's often what's, what's used to clean um, glassware like bongs and bowls and stuff. Q-tips, if you're, you're missing tons of Q-tips, um, and that's often used to clean out dab rigs. And then of course, logos and merchandise. So Illadelph is a, is a popular brand um, around the Philadelphia region. Um, you know, you're seeing pot leaves on things. Um, and 710 is oil upside down and backwards. So if you're seeing 710, that's often indicative of THC oil. Okay, and now what to do if you suspect. This is a really scary time for a parent. So let's say you um, are putting some laundry away in your child's room and you find one of these THC oil pens. Um, there's a lot of emotions you might have as a parent. Fear, anger, 
helplessness, confusion. Um, I really encourage you to take a deep breath in a moment like that and to come up with a plan. Okay, so let's let's take a look at some of these. You want to wait till you're calm and you have a plan. And what this means is if let's say you're married, um, you want to discuss this with your spouse first. Like, what are we going to do? We need to have a conversation with our child. Um, one of the risk factors I didn't mention before is that um, cannabis abuse is more common amongst boys than girls. It can certainly happen with girls, but um, just throwing that out there. Don't talk to them while you believe they're under the influence. You might not get a, a great reaction. They might not remember fully the conversation and they can't be as present as you would like them to be. Ask your child, if you suspect use, ask them if they're using, but also why. This might tell you a lot about your child. Um, if, if you find out that, that maybe they're abusing marijuana because it helps them because they're really anxious socially, that's huge. It can help you figure out what you need to do. If they deny, 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 you have every right to investigate further. Um, this is your child, this is your house, and you don't have to tolerate anything that you're uncomfortable with under your house, um, under your roof. So you can look in their room, their backpack, um, you can drug test, just something to know about drug testing. You can go to you know, your local CVS or something and get a drug testing kit. All that's gonna tell you is yes or no if they used, but not levels. So if you're somebody who is trying to figure out, like if you know your child was using and you told them no way, no how, this isn't happening anymore, and you want to monitor and continue to test, um, they can stay in their system for a long time. So if you want very accurate testing, you really do need to go to like a, a Quest Diagnostic or a LabCorp or whatever you have in your area, because they can give you actual levels of THC. And then you can monitor over time if that went down or went away. Enforce consequences for negative behavior. So don't cover for your child. Don't, don't give them a pass. And this needs to be progressive with whatever they did. If, if you believe this was a one-time thing, um, use whatever consequences you guys come up with as a family, whether that's you know grounding or, or taking things away, no license for however long you can get away with that. Um, and if it's bigger than that, um, then our next suggestions are helpful. You might need to... Um, involve a professional. Seek a professional behavioral health assessment. And this is actually a really interesting time. So um, if you were to look at like an outpatient um, adolescent treatment provider in your area, one of the, the things that um, you look for is somebody that can do an evaluation of your child to let you know how significant their use is and what to do about it. And for a lot of parents, getting their child in the car and to a place is an enormous fight and it's very stressful. And now is the potential to be able to do that through telehealth and, and um, online um, with somebody. So that's taking some of the pressure off, but I can't encourage you enough to involve professionals. This is a time in life when your child um, is, is doing things and you're gonna feel like at, at a total loss. Um, and getting help for yourself, like let's say your child's not making any progress or changes with the um, help that you've put into place, getting help for yourself to understand how to communicate with your child, how to take back um, rules at home, um, and then being able to talk to other parents who've been in your shoes is extremely therapeutic. And we're gonna go through this next portion pretty quickly. It's an incredibly important portion and it's what most of the handouts are related to. So I encourage you to go back and read through them very closely, but just, you gotta talk early and often, okay? So we need to set those expectations early with our children that we don't want them using substances. And remember that you are that number one um, influence on your child's relationship with drugs and alcohol. So here's some conversation tips. This is not a once and done conversation that you have with your child. It is something that you are gonna have throughout their entire middle school, um, high school, and, and even college. And sometimes you even have to have conversations with your adult children about concerns that you have. So this is not a once and done conversation where you say, okay, tonight at eight o'clock, we're gonna sit down as a family and discuss drugs. Don't do that. Um, <laughs> you want this to be a relaxed, calm conversation. So let's say after this training today, you've decided, okay, I need to talk to my kid a little bit further about this. 
maybe you guys can take the dog for a walk today. And if it feels like the right time, bring it up. Um, and another tip I have for conversations is we don't want this to feel like a lecture. A lot of times when I talk to young people, they say, my parents don't talk about drugs with me. They talk about drugs at me, meaning they don't ask for my opinion. They don't ask for my experience. They say, don't do this. Um, and then they go on a lecture. So we want to ask a lot of open-ended questions and be positive and not shaming and keep an open mind. Um, and let's take a look at on the next slide, some of those open-ended conversation starters that you could go with. So I love what will you do if scenarios with kids. It gives them a chance to think um, about how they'll problem solve before the situation happens. So let's say you're about to drop your 15 year old off at a birthday party. Um, you could say, so if there's drinking or marijuana use at the party, what are you gonna do? And then the two of you can come up with a plan together. Are they gonna text you to leave? Are they gonna stay, but they're just, you know, if, if they're feeling like confident enough that they can stay away from it, um, they'll stay. Like, what are you going to do? So coming up with that answer together as a parent and a child and having a solution in place is great. Um, what do you think of marijuana and kids that use it? How would you handle it if your friends wanted you to try? Let's say that they've got this new friend. You could say, tell me about their parents. And if they say, oh my gosh, they're so cool. There's the house that everybody hangs out at. They're so fun. Huh, you know, <laughs> maybe that's not a bad thing. Um, but, you know, it could lead to, to some additional conversations. And maybe those are parents you want to get to know so that you make sure this is not just the, the, the cool parents where, you know, anything goes. Um, and then you can see what some of these other questions are. And be ready for the fact that you might get some pushback if you open up this conversation. And one of the questions that if you open up a conversation about substances with teens is that they might turn around and say to you, well, did you smoke when you were younger? So be prepared for that and how you're going to answer that. And the advice is not to lie, but it's not, you don't have to give a ton of detail. So you can say things like, you know, I felt a lot of pressure at your age and I'm not going to pretend like I didn't give in. It made me do some really stupid things and I'm extremely lucky that nothing terrible happened to me. And then if you have other people in your life who are cautionary tales, you can bring those stories up um, and then turn it back on them. Um, are you feeling pressure to use, right? So some of these other questions on here, this is all from that marijuana talk kit. And it gives you really good comeback responses for these. All right, so we, I think, are going to open this up for Q and A now. Um, I tried to keep on time. I'm a, maybe five minutes over. My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> you did great. Um, I just wanted to go over while, while we're waiting for questions to come in. So go to the questions section right now, and go ahead and place your questions. Um, just a reminder again, parent. COVID-19 Survival Guide to Teen Screen Time and Gaming Excess is going to be on Monday, May 18th at 2 o'clock. Registration is open at operationparent.org. Um, we are running a special for our parent handbooks. We have a hand, parent handbooks for elementary and also for middle and high school going over topics such as um, marijuana, drugs, alcohol, screen time, um, emotional health um, issues. Um, we are, I'm sorry, they are available for purchase at operationparent.org. You can shop online, and when you go in, we are offering a discount of 20% off of the purchase of one parent handbook. Please use this code that's on the screen, and you must order by May, May 6th to get that discount. It's WEB042720 to receive that discount. You can follow Operation Parent on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and we also have our e-newsletter, which a lot of you do receive, and we also do um, community presentations, and we Obviously, we do more webinars. So with that, I'm going to open it up, Michelle, and um, we're just going to have a little Q&A here. Um, so go ahead, Michelle. We have lots of questions that have come in, so I'm excited. And thank you so much, Christine, for a great presentation. Um, our first question is, do you have suggestions on how to talk to an 18-year-old that doesn't hear what you have to say because they consider they are considered an adult and they also consider themselves an adult. 
Yeah, that, it certainly gets gets tougher um, once they hit that age. Um, and again, I think that you just, once they're an adult, if they're still under your roof, that's a little different. Once they go off to college, um, if they are away, um, that that's a whole other challenge. Um, it's still our job, even when they hit that age, to be the voice of reason and to continue to talk to them about the fact that even at 18, their brain has not developed. If you're aware that they have some of the risk factors that we talked about today, making sure to educate them about those things. If they're still under your roof, letting them know, like, this is still my expectation of you while you're living with me. I am very uncomfortable with you doing anything illegal within my home. Um, letting them know that even in states where it's legalized, it's not legalized for 18 year olds. It's for kids that are in some states 21 and over and for some 25 and over. So even though they might uh, feel like they've got all of the information and stuff, they're still at high risk. Um, so I think it's not easy, but we continue to kind of challenge lovingly some of the opinions that they might have. Um, and always encourage them to make, you know, the best choices for themselves um, that are going to set them up for success in life. Awesome. Um, this is a tough question. What What would you say to a parent who lives in a household where the other parent doesn't have the same philosophies about, about marijuana? One parent is for and one parent is against use um, for their teen. Yeah, that's a really challenging one because all of the advice says you really got to get on the same page or your child is just going to lean more towards the one um, that feels the way that they, you know, they want. And I've certainly been in assessments with parents and children where I've seen that happen. Um, and the kid just wants to, you know, go with if it's dad that is okay with it. Um, so I, I guess you want to have the majority of these conversations without your child, you know, your child shouldn't see you arguing about this in front of them. Um, it might be the kind of thing where, where maybe together the two of you want to go, if this is a big issue, um, and talk to a, a professional. Um, I would encourage the person that is a little bit more lenient to kind of educate themselves a little bit more. Um, I know one of the attitudes is there's something there, there are so much worse things they could be doing. And of course, that's true. I think most parents would prefer if their child, you know, had the option that they would be experimenting with marijuana over something like heroin. But the bottom line is, why do we have to expect that they're going to do anything? Um, why can't we have the expectation that uh, they're going to stay free and clear of marijuana for as long as possible, so that, you know, they have the best shot for themselves? So I would encourage you guys to have as many, you know, debates and conversations, um, not in front of your child, because if they see you split like that, they will use that to their advantage. Um, and, and just see if you can get more on the same page. And I, I just say err on the side of protecting your child. There's, there's really nothing good that can come out of marijuana experimentation, especially when there are young teens. A parent um, gives all of us a really good tip. She said that she found in her teen's room a bunch of cut phone chargers, about 20 of them. And when she Googled that, she learned that, that the, one of the uses for that is to charge the a vape pen. And so prior to that, she would have never imagined that, you know, this would be happening in her own home. But she did the work, investigated, and um, figured that out. That's great. You're the second, that's the second parent that's brought that up to me. So I need to add that into presentation too. And with all these different vapes, um, who knows if they're vaping nicotine, if they're vaping THC, um, these devices all look so interchangeable. Um, but you might start to see some interesting things. I have a, a girlfriend whose son has been vaping nicotine for six weeks. And in those six weeks, this is a kid who's gone from never having these issues before to having frequent nosebleeds and twice having tonsillitis. So if you're noticing like newfound health issues with your child, it could be an indicator of something's going on too. Awesome, thank you. Um, do you, do you have any advice for a parent who's asking, what are the effects of using marijuana in children with aut autism? 
Um, so I can't say that I know a ton about that. I am aware that there are some parents um, using CBD oils and things like that with their child who has autism. Um, what I can tell you is that there's not research that has been clear that has backed up that. Um, and I would say that that's, you know, that's such a, a serious um, developmental issue that you need to be closely connected with a doctor, obviously, and talking things like that through. I don't advise any parent to be kind of experimenting on their own with that kind of stuff. Um, but I certainly don't feel like enough of an expert to say that they that, that, that research backs that up. I'm not aware that it does. But I am aware that that's a conversation. Got it. Thank you so much. Um, good. And can um, you know how we hear a lot about the increase in appetite that marijuana causes? Do you see in yes. some teens that it causes a loss of appetite? Um, I have I've definitely found that when somebody is trying to reduce their use that you could see a significant drop or a lot of stomach upset, upset and things like that. Um, but in general, I'm not aware that it causes a decrease in appetite when a person is actively using. Um, it kind of generally triggers them to have an increase in appetite. Um, so, yeah, you know, that's an interesting question. Okay, great. Um, so my teen has gone for a behavioral assessment and the teen wouldn't talk in said assessment, how should I <laughs> proceed as a parent? Oh, yeah, that's hard. Um, so this, I'll talk first for somebody that is needs to have one done but has not yet. I would really encourage you to do your homework to find somebody that is really skilled at getting through to teenagers. There is a bit of an art to this, um, somebody that, that can get teens to open up is generally really um, has a lot of experience working with teenagers, is really good at motivational interviewing, is really good at breaking down defenses. Um, so I think it's important to, to do your research, to ask questions, um, and ahead of time, um, set yourself up to have as much success with that as possible. Um, but if you do have a child that has completely shut down through that process and you're at a loss now for what to do, that is when I really suggest that you go and get some counseling for yourself to kind of talk to a professional about this is what's going on right now. These are the behaviors I'm seeing at home. My child is not listening to me. They're doing what they want. I'm really concerned. This person might be able to help you figure out how you can kind of reclaim your house and set the boundaries and work through the, some of the defiant behaviors that you might see coming out of that. And then unfortunately, um, some kids really need to, to experience pretty significant consequences, consequences that you might give, consequences they might get from school. Um, we're always trying to protect kids against that, but sometimes those consequences really help them to open their eyes and, and move through those stages of change where they're a little bit less defensive and a little bit more willing to, to take a look at their use and um, possibly make some changes. A question along the same lines. Um, my child is addicted. What should be my very first step? So I would again um, just kind of ask if you've gone to the professionals. Trying to manage this on your your own as a parent, I don't suggest. Um, it's so overwhelming. Um, it is so confusing. You can feel so lonely when it comes to this. If you go to um, a, a professional, what they can help you to figure out is what level of care does your child need? Um, some kids uh, who are fairly early on in their use need more like education. Some need outpatient counseling. Um, there's a level called intensive outpatient counseling where somebody gets individual group family therapy and drug testing. And then there are residential treatment programs um, where your child would live there for, for a period of time um, and be completely taken away from the option of using substances and then they could help them with that, that withdrawal period. Um, but sometimes the, the defensiveness um, of getting a child to one of those programs, it, it really um, makes it almost a waste of time if they're not open to it. So you might need to start lower, um, finding out what would they be willing to do 
uh, can you at least get them to an outpatient program with somebody that can kind of slowly help them to realize um, that they need to make some changes? Um, would they do an intensive outpatient program? So some of this involves, um, you know, working with a professional that can help the two of you come up with a plan um, and making that happen. So it's not an easy, this is exactly what you do. The, the struggle and the, the um, frustration with behavioral health is that it is really challenging. If somebody has, you know, diabetes, you say you do this, this, and this. And when it comes to behavior, it changes and it's challenging. Um, but there are professionals out there um, that do this for a living. They help families to realize how to handle these things. And I really suggest you don't try to handle it on your own. Um, your insurance company could tell you um, who is available in your area. And oftentimes, it's, it's like so many other things, to get somebody who's extremely qualified um, if you're in the position to be able to pay a little bit more, to pay out of pocket or pay a sliding scale, you might be able to work with somebody who's a little bit more um, effective in reaching your team. Awesome. That's awesome advice. And next, we have a parent that's in the middle of treatment, and they're trying to, um, I guess, it looks like get an admittance into a treatment center but they're being and they're being told through the insurance authorization authorization that there's that this doesn't happen for just weed. Yeah. Hey. Would that be the um, case or is, I mean what it can different? be. I know that a lot of insurance providers would prefer that you do a lower level of care for marijuana. So they're gonna want to see that your child tried outpatient and wasn't successful. They tried intensive outpatient and wasn't successful. If you can kind of demonstrate that you're really concerned about their physical or mental health, um, then that might increase the likelihood that they would um, approve that. Um, I would suggest, I think it wouldn't hurt you. I'm not trying to, to push people towards Karen, but our admissions department um, is really good at helping people kind of talk through that. Even if Karen is by no way, shape or form an option for the family, they can help them to come up with another plan and kind of talk that through a little bit more. Um, but I'm not surprised you're hearing that, but there are absolutely treatment programs that will accept your child um, and hopefully work with you to make it as affordable as possible. Um, so, you know, Karen is C-A-R-O-N, and you can look at um, the 800 number, and they might be able to just give you some advice. Okay, great. Um, we've had lots of questions asking if the slides could be shared on social media or the recording could be shared um, with parents following the presentation. So, Mary Beth, I'll, yeah. I'll turn it to you for that. Okay. Um, yes, the um, the slide handout has already been sent in, and it is also one of the handouts that's available. Um, the recording will be sent to you tomorrow around three o'clock in the afternoon Eastern time. You will receive an email, and in there will be a recording. Now, if you want to share the link in particular on your website or on your social media. Um, you just need to send me an email to um, marybeth at operationparent.org and I will send you that link and then you're free to share that with your um, families or your community. Um, I, I have a question that came in prior to this from a parent who could not attend um, and sort of similar where she's found out her teen is using uh, marijuana and the teen is now saying that they would like instead to use CBD oil um, in hopes of helping them relax and feel focused. Um, is that, I, I know what I've heard about CBD, that there's not anything in particular on that side. So I'm just asking, what, what do you know about that? All right, so um, I think it would certainly be a more positive uh, approach for them to, to be working on their anxiety than using marijuana. Um, I think as I, as I already said, there's not definitive like, you know, FDA approved CBD medication that is for that, but there's um, a lot of research being done and some of it's pretty promising. Um, so as I said before, I would just say if they're on any medications, talk to the doctor do your research, make sure that you're finding something um, that is more reputable, um, and be aware that it might be the, this is not gonna get them high. So your child might not 
be experiencing what they're hoping they experience from it. Um, and I would certainly suggest that if your child is struggling with anxiety, that you work with them on other techniques like, you know, uh, breathing, uh, mindfulness. Um, you guys could download the, the Calm app together and take a look at some of those things. Um, get them on an exercise routine, take a look at the amount of caffeine or other things they might be taking in and try to look at more of a holistic approach for how to handle their anxiety, mm -hmm. which I know is, is huge right now. Um, right. And and everyone's looking for ways to, to handle that. Thank you. Um, how about we do two more questions, Michelle, and then we'll shut it down. Sounds good. So okay. I see one that just came in. Um, so it's a parent whose teen is already addicted to marijuana and now trying new drugs. He's in therapy, but he just doesn't seem to care for anything at all. Uh, I'm so sorry that you're you're dealing with that. Um, it's not uncommon. I know that for a lot of people, they worry that marijuana is kind of a gateway drug. And I can say that not everybody that uses marijuana will progress, um, but everyone that that does progress generally had a love affair with marijuana at some point. Um, and unfortunately, you know, this is not an uncommon experience. We see this with substance use disorder treatment that um, there's often several different treatment stays before somebody um, gets to a place where they've really accepted um, the idea of recovery and sobriety. Um, so that is a question that I'm happy to talk with somebody offline if they just want to, to have a conversation and, and get a little bit more support around that. Um, but I just say you have to continue to, to stay involved with um, good, effective treatment. Um, make sure that your, your child is following whatever continuing care plan that they get when they are um, discharged from treatment. Um, I don't know your child's age. Um, but a lot more options for effective treatment open up once somebody hits 18. Um, there's a lot more treatment centers out there. There are ones that, um, that will help them step down to more of a sober living kind of situation. Um, so it's, I'm sorry you're going through that. It's, it's not uncommon and I hope you're getting support for yourself and that one of these days it's going to click with your child. We see people get well all the time. Thank you. Thank you for that hope um, that you're also planting. We we have another family in a, in a similar struggle. Um, the daughter has recently been put out of the house, uh, just in hopes of a last resort that she might be um, able to open her eyes and um, and deal with her addiction issues. Do you have any additional advice for that family? I, that's yeah. I mean, it's it's just so hard. You 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 try everything, right? You you try the the love and support, and then you try the tough love, and um, all of those things, and you just hope that one of these days something will stick. Um, bottom line, if you have other children in the home, you really you 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 can't allow um, your child's addiction to impact the entire family and drag everybody else um, into into to sickness. Um, so it's really important that um, you know you're you're trying to protect yourselves and your other children as well. Um, and I, I also hope and pray that this will be something that that um, will be a wake up call to your daughter. I've certainly seen it work. Um, and if she she comes back home, you know you just keep following the advice of professionals. I know that you're not doing this on your own. Um, it's not uncommon what, what, what all of you guys are going through. And I hope that you're getting, um, you know, in parent support groups yourself to kind of talk through with other parents who've been there um, with, with what to do. Thank you so much. Um, we did get a couple. We do have a few more questions in the queue that we weren't able to get to. So I apologize for that, but we will follow up with folks. Um, I did want to close with one compliment that you received. You received many. Um, but this one says, this presentation is so good. We love how Christine broke down the risk versus protective factors. Um, good way to get past the health jargon that we as professionals use and break it down. So thank you. You bet. All right. Well, with that, we're going to go ahead and close down the webinar. And Christine, thank you so much. And Michelle, thank you. Oh, it's my for, pleasure. Um, yeah.
for all of your work here today. Um, and my pleasure also. Uh, please uh, just wait for tomorrow around three o'clock. You will receive an email with this recording. And if you, uh, you will receive the survey immediately once we shut this down. So with that, thank you so much and goodbye. Thanks.